On a graduation day like this, we often talk about hope for the future and empowerment for our graduates to go into the world and accomplish great things in and for the world. On days like this, we don't often talk about suffering. We don't talk about how each and every one of you will face valleys on the journey. Suffering is inescapable, and as the life of our commencement speaker so vividly attests, it is something that can bring great glory to God. In her life, Johnny Erickson Tata has been a shining light in the Christian world and an inspiring example of how God uses suffering to grow us spiritually, to bring him glory, and to witness to the world. Ever since a diving accident at age 17 left her a quadriplegic in a wheelchair, Johnny has known her fair share of suffering. But in spite of the seemingly unjust turn her life took as a teenager, Johnny has nevertheless lived a faithful life for Christ, heeding the Lord's call on her life to communicate the gospel and equip churches worldwide to evangelize and disciple people affected by disabilities. Through her ministry, Johnny and Friends, which she started in 1979, Johnny has made huge strides for disability-related issues, raising awareness within the Christian community as well as in the American government and throughout the world. In her more than 30 years of ministry, Johnny has authored 40 books, spoken to millions of listeners at conferences, or on her Johnny and Friends radio show, organized hundreds of retreats for special needs families, and donated thousands of wheelchairs to disabled children and adults in developing nations. In 2007, Johnny helped establish the International Disability Center in Agora Hills, which now functions as the administrative center for her numerous ministries, serving thousands of families across the globe affected by disability. Among her many accomplishments, Johnny received the Gold Medallion Lifetime Achievement Award in 2003 from the Evangelical Christian Publishers Association, was named Church Woman of the Year in 1993 by the Religious Heritage Foundation, and was the first woman to be honored by the National Association of Evangelicals as their layperson of the year. She has also inspired many with disabilities as she's created beauty on a canvas with a paintbrush between her teeth. Johnny and her work are the inspiration behind a biblical studies integration course here at Biola University titled Theology of Suffering and Disability, which wrestles with a theology of suffering and disability in the midst of trusting in and following a good and sovereign God. Biola University is the first university to offer an undergraduate course like this, which invites students to develop a solid biblical view on the subject. Following in Biola's footsteps, many other universities have taken interest in offering the course, desiring to follow Biola's lead to raise awareness of the increasingly prevalent issue of disability. Johnny's considerable contributions in public service include serving on the National Council on Disability under two U.S. presidents, and she currently serves on the Disability Advisory Committee to the U.S. State Department. Her story has attracted the attention of media outlets, as she was featured on Larry King Live, among other prominent broadcasts. She has been selected as a speaker for the 2010 Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization in Cape Town, South Africa, in what will be a seminal moment for this generation, as Johnny and a few other selected speakers address 4,000 Christian leaders attending from all over the world, plus millions more through distributed media. In her life's work, Johnny has proven to be an important voice of compassion in Christendom. She's been a vocal champion for life, a defender of the sick and downtrodden, and a shining example of the impact one soul can make. Johnny, you are an inspiration to us all. And thank you for your willingness to take up the cross and follow Christ. Thank you for modeling a humble and strong spirit of Christian service. Thank you for making such a difference in so many lives for the cause of Christ. And thank you sincerely for your support of Biola University over the years. You are family here, as we talked about a few minutes ago. And you are a friend. And we love you. And we thank you for being here today. As I confer the honorary degree... I'd also like to invite Johnny to come forward, her husband, Ken Tata, Mr. Stan Jantz, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, and Dr. Dennis Dirks, Dean of Talbot School of Theology.
Thank you. Johnny, in celebration of your service to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord of the nations, the Board of Trustees of Biola University hereby confers upon you, Johnny Erickson Tata, the honorary degree Doctor of Laws, with all the rights, privileges, and honors pertaining thereto. In witness thereof, we have affixed the corporate seal of Biola University in the year of our Lord, 2010. Wow. Congratulations, Dr. Johnny Erickson Tata. Now please welcome our commencement speaker, artist, author, advocate, and now alumna of Biola University, Dr. Johnny Erickson Tata. Thank you so much, President Corey and Special thanks to the Board of Trustees, families, friends. So grateful for this grateful honor. This is quite a humbling moment for me, and I can't think of a better place to be spending a Saturday morning than with you friends here at Biola. Congratulations on this special day. Not only to you graduates, but also to your family and your friends who have cheered you on and prayed for you for this special time. I am gonna consider it an honor to sit up here and watch each of one of you walk across this stage. And I want you to know that as you do, I will be praying specifically for you. I want you to be able to say that Johnny Erickson Tata prayed personally for you on the day that you graduated here from Biola. God bless you and thank you so much for this special honor. <laughs> of all the things that I love to do, and Dr. Corey mentioned a few of them, I love taking what I've got left of these 43 years that I've lived as a quadriplegic in this wheelchair. I love energizing believers like you. This university, like none other, has prepared you to advance Christ's kingdom. I mean, you guys have sweated, you have studied, and now you are prepared for powerful ministry. Are you ready? Let's hear it, are you ready? Yeah. Well, I can recall a time that I wasn't ready. There was a time serving in the line of ministry to people with disabilities that I now do. It was not my cup of tea way back when, because I tell you what, every disabled person I knew I disliked. From the militant activists that would chain themselves to inaccessible city buses, all the way to the students at the University of Maryland where I attended, who complained about the smallest injustice if there wasn't a ramp or a widened doorway or an elevator, not a one of them had my sympathy. What was odd is that I was in a wheelchair. But back then, in the early 70s, after the accident in which I broke my neck, the last thing I wanted to do was to hang out with somebody else like me in a wheelchair. I mean, I left all that behind at rehab. And the only time I had to encounter other people with disabilities was during an occasional checkup at a local clinic. Well, that was fine with me. Well, after about another year or two, time passed, and it was time for me to grow up. My wheelchair and the wheelchairs of others began to take on a different perspective, especially as I examined the life of Jesus Christ. My sister used to put my Bible on a music stand, much like this one in front of me, and with a mouth stick between my teeth, I'd flip the pages this way and that back and forth, and on every page of the gospel, I saw Jesus hanging out with somebody with a handicap, always connecting with people who were blind or deaf, paralyzed. Jesus seemed to go out of his way to strike up conversations with people like me. His heart seemed to go out to the blind, to the deaf. He seemed to reserve his most tender touch for fathers of little boys with seizures. And the Lord seemed to be saying to me, Johnny, these are the persons among whom I want you to serve. I said, say what? I said, God, you gotta be kidding. I mean, I love you, but really, why don't you get a, a, a graduate student in rehab counseling? Or, or how about asking somebody born with a disability? Lord, you can't be choosing me. 
My self-image is still shaky. I feel funny around other people in wheelchairs. And I am not entirely convinced that this paralysis is part of that, quote, all things fitting together for my good. Lord, I love you, but please, let me serve you some other way. But then I stumbled across a convicting verse. We heard it this morning from the scripture. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. Do nothing out of vain conceit or selfish ambition, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to, you, only to your own interests, but to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit? Is that so, Lord? Okay, let me get this right. You mean that I am to consider that obnoxious jerk at the clinic who sits in his wheelchair by the elevator and he smokes like a chimney and every time I wheel by he taunts me because I'm a quadriplegic and he's a paraplegic. You mean that I'm to consider him better than me? You, you mean that serving people like him is what you want me to do? I got the answer again in Philippians chapter two. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Okay, Lord, I'll serve, but I won't like it. I'll be obedient, but I'm sure not going to enjoy it. Finally, we were getting to the crux of the problem, my attitude. And somewhere in between those two verses, it hit me. Christ did not lay down his life in a vacuum for others, an emotional vacuum, no. Christ did not lay down his life for others without feeling and passion. He served with warmth, with zeal, with spirited affection, even pleasure. And if I would but draw closer to him, I could possess his passion and his pleasure for reaching out to people too. And friends, this is why you have invested your years here at Biola University. God did not bring you here merely to prepare you for simply a job. He's not prepared you just to punch a time clock from nine to five. No, you have not studied this hard for your degree just to push paper and, and show up for a career after graduation. No way. God has prepared you to share his great good news with people and to do it as he did, with warmth and passion and zeal and spirited affection. No five-year plan you'll embark on in the future is ever more important than the people God is gonna call you to serve. Earlier this week, I read a quote from a Harvard University study. And students in the MBA program were signed to create a strategic plan for their lives. The topic was, what do I hope to achieve in life after graduation? Well, tabulating the priorities, number one was wealth. Number two was notoriety. And number three in the list of priorities was a category that involved status. You know, your type of car, or who you married, or your home. Interestingly, none of the strategic plans picked in the life goals had anything to do with serving people. And Ken Tata, can you come up here and turn this page? Because I've got a doctorate robe on, and I'm stuck. <laughs> well, guess what, guys? You're not graduating from Harvard University. You are graduating from Biola University, yeah. <laughs> All right. You are preparing for a life of heartfelt service that reflects the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ for people. But just how do you generate this attitude of the saviors? How do you keep from buying into that Harvard MBA attitude? How do you consider others better than yourself? Well, I can tell you what, friend, many years have passed since those days when I dragged my feet, when I put my wheelchair on slow speed, when I refused to think that service could be a joy. But now, after scores of taking wheelchairs around the trip, around the world, thousands of wheelchairs around the world, after going to countless rehab centers to talk to newly injured people, after facilitating so many congresses and congresses on reaching people with disabilities, or teaching counselless disability workshops, I can tell you what, I have learned that it is a passion for God which always results in a passion for people. 
And you must get this, friends. You must believe this. You must live it. You must breathe it. You must buy into this before you walk across this platform, get your degree, and go out into the world. A passion for Christ is what will result in your passion for people among whom you'll serve when you leave here. And this sort of intimacy with Jesus Christ only happens at the cross. None of us is attracted to the cross. We really don't readily embrace the cross because it always demands so much of us. I mean, who wants to daily take up his cross and die to the sins that Jesus died for at Calvary? We don't like to admit it, but often we prefer the cushier life of that Harvard study. And so God gives us some help. He gives us suffering. He gives us affliction, hardship, trials that drive us to the cross, like this wheelchair drove me to the cross, where we find peace and power and help and hope. And speaking of help, Ken, I need you again because this microphone's fallen off my ear. And as you well know, I'm wearing a doctor robe and I'm stuck. <laughs> Stick it on there good, buddy. There you go. I'll tell you what, my broken neck, as you can see, I need help, right? My broken neck is, is, is no different than your broken heart when you need help or your broken dreams. Those things are like a sheepdog. When we experience broken in our, brokenness in our life, suddenly the pride gets deflated. No longer can you cherish inflated ideas of your own significance or importance. And like a sheepdog, God uses suffering to snap at your heels and drive you down the road to Calvary where otherwise you might not be humanly inclined to go. We're not naturally attracted to the cross, but God gives us those hardships to drive us into his arms by the overwhelming conviction that often we just ain't got nowhere else to go but to Jesus. We need Jesus. And that Harvard crowd, Absolutely. We need Jesus because there it's only at the cross where we are stripped of our pride, where God sandblasts our soul, where he strips us of the sins of anxiety, fear, self-importance, self-consciousness, anxiety for the future. He strips us of those things. And then our souls can be better bonded to the saviors. We can better, be better hot glued to his heart and our heart gets beating in rhythm with his. And then, what do you know? God shares his joy only on his terms, and those terms call for us to, in some measure, suffer as his precious son Jesus did when he walked here on earth. But when that happens, oh, the joy that comes spilling and splashing over heaven's walls, pouring down into our hearts and, and rushing out to others in a, in a stream of encouragement and rising back up to God in a static fountain of praise but it only happens at the cross. The Harvard University crowd would say that's foolishness, but 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 says that God chooses the foolish things to shame the wise. He chooses the weak things of this world to shame the strong. Christ is God's foolishness. Christ is God's weakness. And you and I need him desperately in all of our foolishness and weakness. And so does the so do the folks at Harvard, and so does everybody else in the rest of the world. Jesus is passionate about reaching the world. Jesus is passionate about reaching the people at Harvard and far beyond that. It's what this wheelchair has taught me, and it's what I know your own hardships have shown you during your time here at Biola. Hardships, your headaches, my wheelchair, they keep us near the cross keep us needing Jesus urgently. They keep us in that intimate, sweet union with him. Why, I remember when I was in Ghana, West Africa, delivering wheelchairs and Bibles, I had one man with a disability crawl up to me, and he leaned back on his haunches and spread his arms wide and said, oh, Johnny, welcome to our country where God is so much bigger. He is bigger here because we need him more. God always seems bigger always seems bigger to those who need him most. So friends, wherever God may lead you, wherever you end up serving him, whatever career you may choose, stay near the cross. Stay needing God desperately. Taste the bread of heaven and see how good he is when you're hurting. 
Drink deeply of the living water when your heart, when your heart is breaking. Be the branch that relaxes in the vine. Someone has said that a cross-filled life is merely filled with cross-filled days. So die to sin and leave, live to Jesus. And don't stop until you're dying to know him, until you nail every sin to the cross, every part of yourself that stands in the way. And when you do, when you find yourself floating in his love, wild horses won't be able to keep you from serving with passion. Passion sent straight from heaven. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7 puts it this way. Serve wholeheartedly. And you know what? I do that now. And I love what I do. I love bantering with my militant activist friends back in Washington, D.C. I love ministering to obnoxious jerks who sit in their wheelchairs next to elevators, smoking packs of camels. I love sitting by the bedsides of ventilator-dependent quadriplegics. I'm inspired by the guy with cerebral palsy who keeps his smile despite living a dreary existence in a, in a nursing home. But I'll tell you what, it all falls apart. It all becomes vain ambition if there is no intimacy with Jesus Christ. And so this summer, I'll be delivering wheelchairs, I'll be delivering Bibles, and I'll be doing it with passion. And with all the disabled people I will meet, I'll picture Jesus. I'll picture him moving ahead of me, ahead of my wheelchair and delighting in the smiles on the faces of everyone I meet. And as sure as I will be there, I know he will be there, carrying their cares, returning their smiles, touching every need and every hurt. He will be serving with all his heart. And that means this summer and for the rest of your life, you can serve with all your heart too. And you know what? You don't have to break your neck to do it. God bless you and congratulations on your graduation. Dr. John Erickson Tata, thank you. Thank you for talking about the cross. Thank you for pointing to the cross. Thank you for taking us to the cross. Thank you to, for, for leaving us at the cross. And thank you for reminding us all that we need to be tethered to the cross, which, a place that will never let us go. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.